My job as a journalist is to provide access to difficult truths, truths that by their very nature can sometimes be hard to confront. Because and white power signs. Why are these people attracted to you and your platform? And the tricky part about telling these stories is that as a journalist, and certainly as a female journalist, you often know in your gut what comes next. The threatening tweets, the DMs attacking your competence, your looks, your credibility, even your education. I've been on the receiving end of each of those things, and unfortunately, most women in my profession have. It's not fair, it's not right, it's not just, and it certainly does not have to be our reality. Because courage is a job requirement for us, and we cannot do our jobs courageously without the consistency of protection. The newsroom across the world, they have a vital role to play in amplifying women's voices and creating spaces for our work and in protecting us when and while we do it. So join the coalition against online violence in taking a stand against online attacks and help us create a brighter, safer future for all women journalists. Hello and welcome. My name is Kathy M and I am the director of the journalism and media program at the MacArthur Foundation. From time to time, we host these jam sessions to elevate and amplify the work of our grantees. And today we are so very pleased to be bringing attention to the outstanding work of the International Women's Media Foundation and the Committee to Protect Journalists. For those of us joining us in Zoom, please feel free to type in your name and affiliations so that we know who's here with us. In addition to the guests in the Zoom web webinar, I'd like to welcome those who are watching live on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Both the International Women's Media Foundation and the Committee to Protect Journalists operate numerous programs aimed at advancing press freedom and press protections in the US and abroad. But today we wanna to talk specifically and deeply about the safety risks facing women reporters and reporters of color and LGBTQ reporters and the precautions that can be taken and the resources that are available. We know that the vast majority of women, BIPOC and LGBTQ reporters have experienced online violence in the course of their work. And many have also endured offline attacks. We also know that many journalists have considered leaving the field altogether because of this abuse, coupled with the lack of support and the lack of inclusion and opportunity they face in their newsrooms. This is unacceptable in an industry that desperately needs to be more representative and inclusive and must do a better job of reflecting and reporting on the priorities and perspectives of historically marginalized groups. Coincidentally, last week, another MacArthur grantee, the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, released an excellent report entitled, The Twitter Type Rope Without a Net. The report looks at how journalists are increasingly expected to use social media to boost audience engagement, but provided insufficient guidance and protection against the perils. And it calls out how women and BIPOC reporters are the ones most affected and most vulnerable. So let's dive into our conversation and let me start by introducing our panel. With us today are Elisa Lise Munoz, Executive Director of the International Women's Media Foundation, Lucy Westcott, Emergencies Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, Vanessa Charlotte, an independent photojournalist, and Lorraine Ali, journalist and television critic at the Los Angeles Times. Welcome to all of you ladies and thank you for joining us. I also want to acknowledge that in our audience, we have many women, BIPOC and LGBTQ journalists who I imagine have experienced or are currently dealing with online harassment or other forms of abuse and attacks. We thank you for joining us and hope that our conversation validates your experiences and that you find information and resources that will be helpful to you. That is our goal today. 
So Vanessa, I'd like to turn to you first. And while I'm setting up your question, please feel free to share links to your work in the chat. <laughs> One of the best parts of doing these jam sessions is the opportunity I have to get to know individual journalists. As a funder, I mostly speak with organizational leaders and fundraisers. So it was such a delight to be able to spend some time with Vanessa uh, earlier, um, a couple of weeks ago. And in my prep interview with Vanessa, I was struck by how very intentionally Vanessa is using her photojournalism to provide an alternative narrative to the one that's commonly told. To show the world what she sees through her eyes and her lens, filtered through her unique lived experiences, which enables her to see things differently. This is so important when newsrooms are lacking in diversity of all kinds, and, but this work is not easy and it is not easily accepted. And it has put her and many others like her in danger. Vanessa, to get us started, please share with us how you came to be in St. Louis in the spring of 2020. Tell us what you were hoping to accomplish as a reporter there and what you experienced both in person and online as you were covering the protests and civil unrest. Absolutely. First, Kathy, thank you, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm honored to be a, with these esteemed group of women. Um, so what happened was in 2020, my family made a decision to reside in St. Louis. Um, I also was very interested in being in a city that was the first stop after the great migration where a lot of African-Americans decided to leave the South and um, move northward. So as it would have it, um, George Floyd would be killed in the streets of, of Minneapolis. Um, we would be facing a global pandemic and um, that became truly a boiling point. And so I remember very, very distinctly, November 29th, 2020, um, I was residing in downtown St. Louis and outside of my window, there were thousands of people that hit the streets. So I must tell you that St. Louis exists in the shadows of the Ferguson uprising. Um, it's a beautiful city, but it's a city that is full of racial tension and strife. Um, there's a lot of socioeconomic disparities in the city. And so thousands of young people and people from all walks of life were outside of my window. And as a photojournalist, and also as a black woman who understood that I was seeing history happen, um, I grabbed my camera, not really thinking about myself um, and ran out into the streets and I began to document what was happening. Um, I understand that history is often told from the position of the victor and not the victim right, which leaves us uh, in a position where we receive half-truths oftentimes and not really understand the complexities and the nuances of certain stories. And so while covering the civil unrest in St. Louis, um, I was indeed tear gassed. Um, there were white nationalist groups that came out. Um, the Proud Boys were there. Um, and so there was also tension from the police, the, the police I deemed to be rather aggressive. And um, I, I knew that I had to walk this fine line, right, of um, telling this important story, but living to make it home to my family. And so um, it, it, was a, it was a difficult, it was a difficult situation. Um, but again, I felt compelled to be able to provide a counter narrative to what the rest of the world was seeing and for it to be told through a lens that really paralleled the community that was being covered. Thank you, Vanessa. And Vanessa, can you say a little bit more about um, how your work was received and whether or not you being a member of the press provided any protection for you in those situations you were in or if it had the opposite effect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my work was received in various ways. Um, people who understand the intention behind my work were really excited. Um, they embraced it with open arms. Um, for example, IWMF has been extremely supportive of the work that I do. 
Um, likewise, there was a lot of backlash. Um, so if you can imagine the negative comments, um, the threatening comments on Twitter and social media, um, I found myself rather terrified when I would go out um, in, in the city and take my family out for dinner or things like that, not sure who was around me. Um, so that was that was really unsettling. And what was your second question? I'm sorry, it escaped me. <laughs> no, you answered it. You you okay. answered the second question first. Thank you. Oh, yes, thank we'll you. come back to you, Vanessa. Let me invite Lorraine into the conversation because Lorraine, I think when we talk about harassment of women and BIPOC journalists, it often feels like we're talking about a relatively new phenomenon. But actually, you educated me about how this is a problem some reporters have been facing for over two decades. Can you talk about the evolution and the escalation of these attacks from your perspective as an Arab and Muslim American journalist? And how being a female critic and opinion writer in particular has perhaps made you more vulnerable? Sure, and again, thank you for having me here. And Vanessa, that's incredible, um, your experience. Uh, so yeah, you know, I was at Newsweek, um, in 2000, that's when I started there. I'm with the LA Times currently, but when I started there, um, I was covering entertainment, covering music, but when 9-11 happened, we literally like had no Muslims, no Arabs on staff. So I started writing about hate crimes against Arab Americans, you know, what was going on against Muslims, against Sikhs. And um, the, the feedback that we got, feedback, uh, was all sorts of letters, but then emails started pouring in. It was almost like a campaign. And it was the first kind of, in my experience, heavily Islamophobic targeted hit, like against me as a journalist. And it was also very misogynistic. Um, Clearly she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, uh, you know, she's a sleeper cell babe. I got that sleeper cell babe, that kind of thing. And they were written to me, but they were also written to management. Um, and it escalated with the kinds of platforms that were out there. Social media became more of like a megaphone out there, definitely emboldened people or it, not even so much emboldened, it gave them more of a, uh, of a way to like shout this message out. And there's absolutely, you know, obviously no accountability, right? And we can talk about like what, we can talk about this later, what the reaction of, you know, the editors was, but I think there was three tiers of it. The first tier was just the initial shock of it. The second tier was the social media attack. I think the third is the Trump administration coming in and that's when you got the emboldened voices, the, the pure hatred and racism and the threats. Um, and those are kind of like the stages, the threat. You could tell the difference in the tone of the kind of uh, emails I was getting sent or what was being posted online. They were getting much more aggressive, uh, much more about race, much more about you know sex. Um, kind of rapey, scary. Um, I was scared and I am scared. I mean, there's, you know, there's situations where, as Vanessa was saying, when I go out, you know, people know what I look like. You can easily kind of find somebody on the internet. I'm thinking, well, you know, these people have written stuff to me. What's out there? Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Lorraine. Yeah. And, you know, both back to you and to Vanessa, I imagine there are the attacks that are coming to you that are sort of at the level of the individual. And then there might be the ones that are sort of more organized by groups of people who belong to maybe some kind of a organization or point of view. And then there might be like the state sponsored or state based government type or police or other kinds of, um, of organizations that might also be um, attacking your work or trying to diminish your credibility. Can you talk about those different levels and how you've experienced that, or if you've experienced those different kinds of um, harassment and, and attack? Yeah, well, look, you know, just to provide some context, I am a proud U.S. Army veteran. And so um, I 
I believe in um, following the law and different things like that. And so because there's a level of camaraderie between the armed forces and the military um, or the armed forces and the police, I, I am sensitive to certain things. But at the same time, um, I do understand how the intersectionality of my race and my sex as a woman um, leaves me vulnerable in these kinds of situations. So I can speak um, directly to being in front of the Florissant Police Department, um, where the police opened fire uh, on someone that was literally 10 feet away from me and being completely terrified at that moment. Right. And and understanding that um, he even though I, I use you know, my army hat or my army sweatshirt just to kind of keep myself safe. I understood then that he, this person may not have been looking at me as a comrade, but instead as someone that can be a potential threat, right? Um, or when I was in front of the art museum in St. Louis and the Proud Boys came out very strongly and um, having my camera and uh, being watched like a hawk and being terrified to go to my car. Because again, I don't know what is going to happen. And Lorraine spoke on that um, quite poignantly. Um, so it comes from so many different angles. And, and the thing is, it's this difficult task, right? Because I love the work that I do. I absolutely love it. Um, but how do you keep yourself safe um, when, you're, when you're doing this kind of work? It's a, it's a continuous question that I, I pose myself. Yeah. And we're going to oh, go ahead, Lorraine. Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, there are, you know, I've definitely noticed that there are group efforts when I'm talking about particularly Islamophobic groups. I know who those players are and I know, you know, when I see them attack me and you can say, sure, it's just this group and I know who they are, but it's dangerous because they're promoting this image of you online and other people don't know who they are. So therefore they're thinking, oh, well, Lorraine Ali clearly is, you know, part of the Muslim Brotherhood, sisterhood, whatever you want to say, you know? And so it, that in itself is dangerous. And also the other thing is, I don't want to have to, I do what I do because I want to raise awareness because I want to tackle things that are not right. I'm going to continue to do that, but at what risk? And I know that's what we're talking about, but Sometimes it hits you and you said, are there times when you've thought about quitting? There were times when I thought about quitting. Yeah, Lorraine, you alluded this to this earlier, um, kind of the role of the newsroom, so the role of the commissioning editors, um, the folks that are, who are assigning you these stories and sending you out there, um, both you as a staff person and Vanessa as a freelancer. Lorraine, tell us a little bit about your experiences because you've been with a number of large media organizations, you know, are they prepared, unprepared, aware, do they care? Tell us a little bit about the experience you have with your own newsrooms. Uh, I would say with Newsweek, you know, when I was there in the 2000s, um, they were wholly unprepared. And I think, you know, they were prepared. I, if you were a war correspondent, which I was not, Afghanistan, Iraq, there was preparations out there for those correspondents. I'm not sure that they were enough, but you know, there was things taken care of. If you were me, you know, covering, writing about your opinions on things, or write, I was writing about my family in Iraq and about, you know, the um, uh, being displaced and things like that. No, it wasn't, it was not only were they not, they were not only not prepared, but they were telling me to be careful of what I was writing because of my last name and because of who I am. And they eventually told me you should probably stop writing about that rather than a protection. And I mean, that's the point where I was like, maybe I should just stop. With, um, as I've rolled forward and as there's become more awareness with it, with the LA Times, I think in the beginning, you know, when I brought up, I'm, I'm really concerned about these emails or this, this and that coming in, there would be the idea of like, yeah, we're all getting hate mail. And there, you know, there was empathy about it, but there wasn't a lot of action. Recently, there has been more action in terms of they have, you know, security. Um, now we have uh, companies that we hire to help us like scrub our information off the internet, our personal information, things like that. So they're getting better at it and they are trying, but it has been a slow, slow response. 
I actually agree completely with Lorraine about that. Um, for me, the editors have not really been concerned about those things. And I, I also think that um, many of them may maybe didn't know what to do with a black woman journalist um, because, you know, like culturally and racially, um, the responses may be a, a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the responses were rather standard, like, yeah, I get PPE, but I'm like, listen, like the Proud Boys are in St. Louis, right? So like, how do I manage that? How do I deal with that? Um, and, and also, um, what kind of emotional support is there after the assignment, right? Um, do I have to go home and, and have my family bear the brunt of my stress and my fear? Or are there more professional channels that I can reach out to in order to help me decompress and process what I just experienced? Yeah, and we're definitely going to talk about that also later on uh, in the hour. Lucy, I'd like to bring you in. Before you joined CPJ, you were also a reporter and some of your assignments took you to unsafe places around the world. And I think that we know it, it's not perfect, but the safety precautions and security risks are better understood with um, reporting in hostile environments. And they might be um, when we think about domestic and online safety. So pr from your perspective as a former reporter, but also um, as someone who runs the emergencies department at CPJ, tell us how you think, our, how you think newsrooms are doing on this issue. Yes, um, so first of all, thank you so much, Kathy, and to my fellow panelists, um, Lorraine and Vanessa, I was nodding my head a lot <laughs> with everything that you were saying. Um, Lorraine, as, as a former reporter for Newsweek myself, um, I was also nodding my head uh, with what you were saying. So yes, you're absolutely right in that when we're talking about um, going to cover a story in a conflict zone, somewhere where there is active conflict or a hostile environment, there are fantastic resources out there, of course, for obvious reasons. These are massively dangerous, um, can be massively dangerous assignments. Before joining CPJ, I had been to, to places that I think, when I think about the work that I do now and the kind of advice that we give to journalists about doing risk assessments and thinking about your personal safety, I had none of, I had none of that. Um, there were no or very, very few conversations that I had, um, especially around online safety as well. And I decided to, to, to come to CPJ with that gap, which is what about the non-hostile environments that are still nevertheless dangerous for journalists? The United States being a very good example, generally. Um, the internet and, and, and reporting on, um, on anything that involves you having to be online, it can be very terrifying as we have heard from, from Vanessa and Lorraine. Um, so in terms of the United States, um, just to illustrate and to further what um, has already been said, at CPJ, we provide safety information for journalists and we are there to respond to emergencies. And between 2019 and 2020, we saw an 80% increase in requests from US journalists seeking information about how they can keep themselves safe while reporting. That's a massive increase. Um, we, we were able to provide that information. It was mainly about how to cover protests, PPE, which has already been brought up, um, resources around online harassment, um, and of course, uh, trauma support and resources about mental health. And I'll be sharing links to all of those, um, all of those things as well shortly. Um, I mean, in the US as well, I don't want to lay blame on anyone at all. There's many different factors. And, and, and as Lorraine said, I do think it is getting better. I think um, the compounded stories that we've all had to, to cover over the past two years, COVID, um, wildfires, environmental coverage, domestic extremism, protests, uh, police brutality, racial inequality, all happening at the same time. These all required a different approach to local newsrooms, to smaller newsrooms, but to all US newsrooms. Um, with their journalists and their safety. So, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now um, and I'll, I'll share some links in a minute as well. Wonderful. And Lucy, when you and I talked before uh, to get ready for this panel, you were sharing some really practical, very simple practical tips and tools for, for individuals uh, to take to protect themselves to some degree. 
And I happen to know based on the RSVP list that we have um, student journalists who are joining us today and a lot of women and POC reporters from lots of small outlets in Chicago and elsewhere that are joining us today. So can you, I know we, we you know, you could probably do a whole workshop on this, but can you just give folks a, a, just a sample of some of the practical things that they could do to protect themselves? I absolutely can. Um, and I'm really, that's great that there's student journalists here. I think this um, safety information and conversations about safety need to happen as soon as possible in J schools, especially. So, so one of the um, one of the first things and the main things that we suggest um, to journalists is to do a risk assessment. Um, you may have heard of, of one of these, you may not have, but basically it is thinking about your assignment ahead of time and thinking about the risks that could be involved in doing that, whether that's to your physical safety, um, your digital safety, or your psychosocial health. Um, so we always like to think as well about a story, it's before, during and after. So just thinking about the life cycle of a story, um, of course, when something is published, that is not the end of it, that can actually be the start of some harassment. I have experienced that myself, the publication of a story resulted in some horrible online harassment. So just at least being aware before you go into something, this is not to frighten or to scare anyone, it is rather to give you confidence in your reporting. Um, and to just be ready in case something something does happen. Um, another risk or another safety threat that we've identified at CPJ through speaking to uh, female journalists in the US is this idea of reporting alone um, or the, the one man or one woman band. So there's slashed budgets at newsrooms, there's fewer journalists, you have one journalist doing the job of two or three, um, whether that's interviewing people and taking photo and video at the same time. Your situational awareness is down at that point. You might have some heavier, expensive qu equipment on you. Um, and we know as well that for photojournalists and for visual journalists, the presence of that equipment can make you a bit more of a target as well. You are identifiably a journalist. So I'll, I'll share some, some tips on that as well. But again, it is about you know, planning ahead of time, making sure you have that situational awareness, checking in with your editorial colleagues as well. Um, I'll talk very briefly about the online harassment and online side of things and digital safety. Lorraine brought up these programs that scrub your data from the internet. Um, yes, we, we, there are ways that you can remove your personal data from the internet. The reason that, we, that journalists would do this is to prevent that information from being weaponized against you. Um, and in case somebody feels like doxing you, which can be a, a horrendous violating experience. So one such tool is delete me. There's many out there that is not the only one. You plug the information in, that's your address, phone number, names of your family members, um, any information that you don't want out there. And it will then take down that information from websites like white pages, um, peoplefinder.com, these, all these websites that buy and sell that information. Um, I, on that note, would love to highlight as well um, the Coalition Against Online Violence Resource Hub um, is a, an IWMF project. It is fantastic. There are a million resources there um, to take a look at, so I'll share that in a minute as well. Um, and one thing I would like to, to point out as well is during, during the protest in the US last year, we received um, at CPJ a lot of, of requests on, on basically how to deal with arrests and how to deal with detentions. What we saw was that this mass, you know, there were many, many arrests of journalists across the US and that is not an area I think local newsrooms were that prepared for. So we worked um, with the Thomson Reuters Foundation to create a guide on, on, on your legal rights. Um, and that, that's what, you know, about, uh, can you film the police? What happens if, if I'm arrested and the police take my phone? Um, writing down the number of, of a legal hotline or your colleagues on your arm in case your phone is taken. That practical advice that is very, very relevant, especially for protest coverage as well. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, let me bring Lisa into this conversation because uh, Truly, IWMF has put the safety and security of women reporters and really the advancement of women journalists at the center of its organization for many, many years. And, um, you know, you're really at the heart of this issue. Uh, and tell us, you know, both what you're doing to hold newsrooms accountable and, you know, 
advocate for better policies and practices in the newsroom, but also what you're doing, practical things that you're doing to protect women um, reporters in the field. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for having us and for highlighting our work. Um, we have been uh, working on the issues of journalism security for women for the last 30 years. And as everybody else has mentioned already, we found ourselves having to look inwardly towards the United States for the first time just a few years ago. Um, and that has made us look at this issue and it has really made security physical and digital a central part of our work for the past several years. I want to say that um, we, we really believe in a culture shift within the news industry. And I'm going to say the news industry on purpose because I'm talking about media organizations as well as freelance journalists. In the last 20 or so years, we've seen a lot more attention being paid to physical security. Many major media organizations have security uh, experts on staff. And one of the things that we're calling for is a recognition that security has to be related to identity. You cannot just have one security plan for your organization for a demonstration. You cannot have one security plan for your entire group of journalists for X, Y, or Z assignment. The person that is doing those security assessments has to be aware and knowledgeable about the factors that identity brings into your personal security. And I know Vanessa was alluding to that in her conversation, and we can talk about that more later when we talk about some of the IWMF's work to assure that there are ample security experts that are representing underrepresented communities within the news media. So it's the double-edged sword, you know, you have few journalists of color, women journalists of color in the news media, while well, there are even fewer security experts there to secure, to help them, um, especially with the knowledge of journalism. So we're asking for just a sea change within the news industry to recognize that very obvious fact to us that identity cannot be separated from security. And we're also not separating digital and physical security. That's another sort of ongoing issue that has, media organizations in the news industry has chosen to uh, dissect from each other when we it's really a whole. We are asking journalists to spend most of their time online and the treatment that they're receiving online has extreme detrimental uh, impact on them, their work, press freedom, the gamut. Um, there are decisions that journalists are making, women journalists, BIPOC journalists are making based on the amount of hate that they are receiving online, whether it's to leave the industry altogether, to not cover a certain issue, to determine how best they can cover a certain issue without uh, receiving that same amount of hate. So we see it as a press freedom issue and we are calling on the news industry to be much more proactive about how they are dealing with these issues. Recognizing, of course, that we're dealing with a media environment with fewer and fewer resources. Um, we are not just telling or asking news organizations to do something, we're actually providing those resources. So we're asking them to reach out to us. These resources are available. We want to make them available to you. And there is really no excuse for not making these resources available to your newsrooms and to your freelancers. Lisa, do you wanna just share a little bit about the way that you have gone into a newsroom and have worked with them on these issues and go deep a little deeper on the online resource hub and introduce that and who's involved in that and how that came to be? Absolutely. Um, very, uh, it, just last year we launched the, uh, re the online violence, uh, the Coalition Against Online Violence and it's a group of 50 organizations, not all media organizations. We really recognize that there are a number of industries that are 
not only addressing this issue, but also experiencing the negative impacts of social media. So uh, working with all of these organizations that are addressing online violence, we have gotten together to create the Online Violence Response Hub, where we are featuring resources from all of this gamut of organizations who are working on this. And through the hub, well, let me back up a little bit and just say the reason we developed the hub is recognizing that there are so many resources on the internet. A number of them are out of date and it's very difficult for a journalist, particularly a journalist who's in the heat of experiencing online violence, to just go out to the internet in general and find the right support. So we wanted to bring everything to one spot and an individual can go into the Online Violence Response Hub, self-identify the need that they have at the moment and find the right resources for them. Additionally, they can ask for individual one-on-one -on -one support, again, as Lucy mentioned before, during or after an experience that they might be having. And I think that's critically important as well. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, Nadine Hoffman, uh, Elisa's colleague, posted a link to the hub. So I encourage all of you in the audience to take a look at that and also share it with your, your editors and newsroom leaders. Um, I want to pull up a Go Can ahead. I just say, I'm so sorry, I didn't respond to your question about how we're working with newsrooms. And yes. I do want to mention it because I'm encouraging anybody who's on here to let your newsrooms know that the IWMF is providing training for entire newsrooms. We've trained the uh, Seattle Times staff, we've worked with all of the McClatchy bureaus, and we've worked with the 19th, along with a number of other media organizations. And again, men and women journalists, and also very importantly, editors and managers need to be part of this ecosystem as well. Thank you. Now, I want to pull up a question that's in the Q&A, and I want to encourage folks in the audience to post your questions in the Q&A section. But I want to pull one up that comes from my own colleague, Jen Humke, um, which is, you know, in addition to the advocacy that you're doing with newsrooms, Lisa, are you also thinking about pressuring the platforms? Because all of this harassment is happening on these platforms. And so we're the question is really, you know, is there are there protocols and policies and pressure that can be put upon the platforms in addition to above and beyond the newsrooms? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, that is part of this whole advocacy effort that the coalition has taken on. And uh, some organizations within the coalition take a more active response to the platforms than perhaps the IWMF does. Um, right now, currently, we're working on a response to Twitter's um, I think what most people would define as a mediocre response to online violence um, that they just came out with um, and the image, um, the ability of individuals to request that images be taken down on Twitter platform and the broader impact that that can have on journalism and on journalists. So we're working on a letter right now to address that. So the platforms are absolutely part of this equation. Um, I always say, and I'm sorry to say this, but I am not optimistic at all that the platforms will ever take decisive action to support and help women journalists stay safe online because it is not their business imperative. It does not make them money and there is very little incentive for them to do so. Thank you. Um, I wanna go back to the, the training of the trainers that you mentioned, Lisa, because one of the things that I really love about what you're doing is that you're creating a new generation of women and when, women of color security and safety trainers, which is a field that's been dominated by men. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? And I know that Vanessa and Lucy are part of it. And so I'd love for you to set it up and tell us a little bit about it. And then I'd love for Vanessa and Lucy to chime in with how their experience has been so far participating in that. Absolutely. Uh, the IWMF has been conducting hostile environments training for women journalists around the world for uh, the last decade or so. And we have come up with a wonderful curriculum that takes identity into account, that focuses on gender. And yet, um, selfishly, we, we, well, we realize that there weren't enough women to train as many journalists as we wanted to train and much less women journalists of color 
women of color with journalism experience. And we thought, how can we contribute to this pipeline of trainers? Um, and finally, we were able to create this uh, next gen trainers program that does just that. And we're really proud of it. And we're very happy to have Vanessa and Lucy representing here. And they can talk much more about the practicalities of the program and what is happening there. Yeah, Vanessa, do you want to jump in first? Um, yeah, sure. So the, the program has been a huge game changer for me. Um, there are a lot of things that I overlooked. You know, like when, you, when you're a journalist and doing the work, you're just trying to get out there and get it done, right? Um, and then you think about yourself later. And so um, addressing not only digital, physical, um, emotional, and biopsychosocial needs have been huge, specifically through my lens. The other thing that has been phenomenal is um, I have a lot of um, women of color who are journalists that reach out to me and they're just like, hey, I'm in this situation. How do I, you know, what, what should I do? And to be able to have the resources to pass it along to them has been, has been huge. So the, the training has been phenomenal. It's, it's a group of, I believe, Lucy, it's like 12 of us, right? Um, and we get together, it's quite collaborative. Um, we really, really look at how does identity impact our safety. Um, we encourage for everyone to come in as their full selves, because the reality is, you know, when you're doing a story, like for example, I can't take off my black skin, right? Or I can't take, I can't take away the fact that I'm a woman. And so I come in with these, in these spaces with these parts of my identity. And I think that's what makes my coverage um, impactful. Um, and so even for the safety training, we do the same thing, which has been great. And I will just add that it's, you know, I can't overstate just how much this program is needed um, from, from, you know, running the emergencies department now and, and just knowing how many times we are asked, can you provide this training for my US newsroom? Can, can you just give us, it's, it's so very important to have trainers of different backgrounds um, like those in, in the next gen cohort, you know, having been through, um, safety and security training myself as a female journalist who you know has dealt with some really quite negative um, situations as a journalist just knowing knowing that it can be done sensitively and with people who care and it, again um, Vanessa I'm so glad you brought up biopsychosocial because we've had this just fantastic training on trauma as well so if there's newsrooms here who need training there's all these trainers available now, and I'd really encourage you to reach out and, and use the trainers. Absolutely. Because, you know, Lucy, when you think about it, um, like the newsroom is becoming more diverse, right? So I also find that it's amazing when IWMF gives us these opportunities to um, do the trainings, and you're looking at individuals who look like yourself, and they know that you get it. Right, so um, it makes the, the training a lot more personalized. Um, and something that people can take take back with them and put in their toolkit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So because you all went there, let's get personal. I mean, let's talk about trauma and let's talk about mental health and also meeting the basic needs of women and um, BIPOC reporters like rent and insurance and childcare during a time of extraordinary pressure, both from the types of attacks and enhancements that we've just discussed and not feeling completely supported and affirmed by your own newsroom, but also working in a pandemic and in a country that's going through a, deep per a period of deep polarization and racial and gender conflict. So Lorraine and Vanessa, you are both, you know, you've shared with me, you're both working moms, you have sons. What is this, what, is, what toll does all of this take on you and your families? Um, Vanessa, would you like me to start on that one? <laughs> <laughs> on this cheery part of the conversation um I, it, it takes a heavy toll uh you know do I want to I wish that I could come into my family clean meaning I wish I could come in without this weight and this baggage of you know whatever it is that I'm that I'm working, you know, everybody has that from work, right? But it's another layer. 
It's a layer of being concerned about your safety, your family's safety, but there's also that nagging psychological thing back there of, did I do something wrong to deserve this? Did I, did I report something wrong? Did some, you know, or also is my employer going to have my back this time? Cause they didn't last time. Or, you know, all of that's running through your head and, you know, you've got to balance that on top of the just rigor of being a journalist, which is crazy all the time, and then a family, right? Then on top of it, you know, my son is, my, my husband's South Asian, my son is brown, and it's, you know, I, the stuff that I'm writing about often is talking about that and the emails I'm getting and the kickback I'm getting from it the language, the hatred. I look at my son and I'm like, how could somebody hate this boy? You know, and it's like, he doesn't know when I walk. He's just like, mom, what's in the refrigerator? And I'm looking at him thinking, oh my God, I want to wrap myself around you and protect you from what I know is out there because I've heard it all day. That yeah. is, you know, um, and I just wanted to say one other thing is that because journalism has been this industry and criticism and reporting that's been men, I think the inclination for women going in, at least my generation has been like, just buck up and be like a dude, just power through it. And that means you're going to get, you're going to catch a lot of flack and just, you know, and then the idea that if you complain about it, or if you voice it, you're somehow, you know, showing a weakness and, you know, no, as a matter of fact, because we're catching a lot more of it. We're catching a lot, a lot more dangerous and psychologically damaging flack. So I just want to dispel that for anybody coming up right now that like, it is not because you're not playing the game right, or it's not because you're weaker. It's because you're a threat and you're scaring people. And that means you're doing your job, but you're just going to get more kickback from it. Yeah. And I, I want to encourage folks to look at some of the links that Lauren has shared to her writings. I mean, just the other day, she wrote something that I, that really resonated with me, um, some television, um, commentary. And I thought, you know, I, I texted Lorraine and I said, wow, you know, this is really awesome, but it's your dangerous work um, because it's not a popular point of view. Uh, Vanessa, how about you? Um, so I'm going to echo a lot of the things that Lorraine said. Um, I am to a boy mom um, and Jacob is six years old. And um, I find myself thinking about at what point does he become like this super adorable dinosaur loving kid to a threat in society, right? Um, and, and also to coming from a community that is already highly policed. And, and I don't necessarily just mean like literally the law, right? But um, coming from a community that we always have to watch what we do, make sure that you're not a threat, make sure you don't wear this, make sure your hair's not like this, make sure you're not walking at this time in this neighborhood or else you're gonna scare people. Like there's all these things and then you enter, um, so, and it's a lot of criticism, right? And then you enter a field that you're, you're challenging a lot of the status quo and things that make people comfortable right? And it's, it's this false idea of comfortability, quite honestly. Um, and so you're peeling back these layers um, and you're a woman and you're a woman of color. And so you're um, being um, attacked quite viciously. It, it is indeed extremely challenging. Um, it's heavy. <laughs> Um, I, I think that like oftentimes um, for myself, you know, I feel like I, I carry around like this rucksack of unsolicited um, ideas and perspectives that are being placed upon me um, that, are, that it's really hard to navigate through. So there are days where like, you know, exactly like Lorraine said, especially with me being prior military, just suck it up and, and do what you have to do. And then there are days where like on the inside you're falling apart, but aside from being a journalist, like you're also a mother, or your partner and you have a family. So like there's still the expectation to like show up. And um, sometimes you, you battle with, okay, I'm gonna show up for everyone else, but who shows up for me, right? When I'm alone and I'm, and I'm grappling with all of these things. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that, both of you. Lisa, you've set up some funds at IWMF in the last couple of years, especially, but you've had them all along. 
that really try to meet women where they're at and some of their basic needs. Can you share about that? Because some of the folks in our audience may not know about those resources. Of course, happy to. Um, yes, emergency support is a major is another major part of the IWMF's work, recognizing that journalists and women journalists often don't have the resources uh, in situations of extreme need. Um, we have a general emergency fund that provides support globally um, and is not limited to any uh, uh, issue. Um, we have an Afghan Afghanistan emergency fund that was just created in the last year that has been providing support for evacuations and also putting some money directly into the hands of Afghan journalists who've had to flee. Um, we have a U.S. emergency fund, and it's interesting to note that 88% of the requests coming into the U.S. emergency fund are for trauma support and uh, those kinds of services. And then we have very specifically a Black Journalist Trauma Relief Fund um, that is specifically for Black journalists to receive trauma support. And that fund to date um, has uh, given $155,000 to journalists in need. The US Emergency Fund um, has uh, also directed, as I said, a huge amount of that fund has gone through to trauma support. So I'm heartened to recognize that at least individuals are seeking this kind of support. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why individuals would come to the IWMF for this kind of help, uh, be it that they don't have health insurance or that they don't want to admit in their media organizations that they are even re receiving this kind of support um, because of the stigma that it carries with it. So we also hope that that kind of uh, mindset changes. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Lucy, I want to turn to you. I know you also um, were involved in um, rescuing and resettling Afghan journalists. And I know that CPJ, of course, has a number of emergency uh, supports as well. Do you want to share a little bit about those resources for our audience? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the emergencies department at CPJ includes our journalist assistance program. So journalists uh, everywhere can contact CPJ for help with emergencies, whether that's um, the paying of medical bills or legal fees, trauma support, um, which has already been brought up. And then of course, um, our biggest need or the, the area that we concentrate on the most because it is the, the biggest need is uh, relocation support, whether that is in the country that the journalist is in or um, outside of the country. So in August, um, when uh, the Taliban moved in and, and, and took over control of Afghanistan, of course, journalists were one of many at-risk um, groups of people in the country. And we at CPJ, like our partner organizations who focus on the safety of journalists everywhere, received um, a truly overwhelming uh, number of requests for help um, to, that really illustrates the desperation and the need for journalists in Afghanistan who are facing very, very real threats to their life still. So we were able to help around 60 journalists and their family members out of the country. Um, those journalists are now in a safe place, um, including in the US um, and Canada as well. And what we are able to do now is for those journalists who are there in a place of safety, um, we, we are also able to provide them with grants to basically help them get back on their feet. Um, many journalists who left and who were evacuated were told, um, or the, the instructions that were given were that they can bring with them one small bag. Um, that's it. Uh, if we think about that's what you carry to work every day, I mean, that's nothing. So journalists are starting their lives in a safe place with their families, but with very little. So we, we are hoping that these grants will at least help them to get back on their feet. And we, of course, hope that they will be able to continue doing journalism um, in the future. Thank you, Lucy. Well, we are just about uh, out of time and should wrap up, but I want to just remind everyone in the audience, again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there are student journalists, journalists from small media outlets, um, some newsroom leaders uh, and others on, on this webinar. And I really encourage you to take advantage 
of the resources that have been mentioned today to take a look at the CPJ website and the IWMF website and seek out these supports and services and funds um, because they're really there for, for all of you who need it. And I think I'm so glad, Elisa, you mentioned the stigma piece because in many cases, you may not feel comfortable uh, reaching out uh, or talking about this openly. Uh, so I really want to thank Lorraine and Vanessa really for sharing their personal stories and for, for being with us and um, kind of giving voice to what a lot of women have been experiencing, but again, may not be able to share openly and publicly the way that you have. Um, your work is so brave and important. And um, I know that folks will be uh, very impressed when they look at it. Um, I want to thank Lucy and Elisa for telling us about all of these resources that are available and the work that your organizations are doing to create better conditions for women journalists and reporters of color. Um, I want to thank the MacArthur team for helping um, support this event and putting everything together. Um, and really, Finally, if you really haven't had a chance, please look at Vanessa's beautiful and powerful work and follow Lorraine's incisive commentary on television and culture. Um, and, you know, we're just beginning to build this community of women um, here, and I hope that we can bring you all back together for a future conversation. And maybe we'll have progressed at that point. Thank you all for joining and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you so much to the MacArthur Foundation. It goes without saying that none of us could do this work without your support. So thank you. You've been a real champion. Thank you so much as well. Thank you, Kathy. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. <laughs> This really appreciate all of you so much. <laughs> Have that a great day. Helpful so nice and great. To meet you, Lorraine. Incredible. Oh, you Incredible. That was helpful and great, you guys. That was wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Did amazing. And really, thank you, Kathy. This was yes. really wonderful. I, I hope that people found it to be very useful. So, too. Thank you all for making the time. Oh, gosh. Pleasure. Oh, and to your colleagues. <laughs> Have a great day and happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Bye.